is uh, one of the key references when it comes to energy and envi environmental challenges. He's a professor of anthropology uh, with a background spe specifically in uh, historical and political anthropology, ant anthropology at Rice University. Um, beyond that, however, um, he has been part of uh, incredibly fascinating projects and I try to post you the, the link um, into the chat so, so that you can see for yourself after the lecture, of course. Um, yes, and just to pick one uh, out, uh, together with uh, Saimin Hu, he produced and co-directed a documentary about and I hope I, it's uh, the right spelling, Okyokul, the first Iceland uh, glacier to fall victim to climate change. And the title of this movie is uh, Not Okay, a little movie about a small glacier, glacier, glacier at the end of the world. And I really recommend that. In addition, however, he, he also served uh, as a, uh, the founding director of the Center of en Energy and Environmental Research in the Human Science at Rice University. Um, and of his many scientific uh, activities, I would like to highlight two in particular. And the first is his current project on energy uh, futures, which deals with the fact that basically every decarbonization decarbonization strategy is linked to a significant energy expansion since energy ensures the status quo, electric vehicles, but also the digital infrastructures. So far, however, little attention has been paid uh, to what an expanded re reliance on nuclear or renewable energy means and what the implications uh, are for climate justice. And secondly, I want to draw a special attention uh, to his latest book, which he wrote together with uh, Timothy Morton. Um, and under the title, uh, Hyper Subject on Becoming Human, the two authors um, continue Timothy Morton's book on hyper objects, um, philosophy and ecology after the end of the world. But even in the first, on the first page, uh, the two authors state that a book on hyper objects uh, is actually unnecessary, unnecessary because everyone uh, and we all know such a hyper object by now, the coronavirus. Um, nevertheless, hyperobjects are uh, objects of such enormous temporal and spatial extent that they can hardly be understood and certainly not controlled by, by us. A black hole, for example, is a hyperobject, but also plastic bags and capitalism. The most extreme example is uh, the global warming. Um, that means hyperobjects produced by humans themselves. The new book tries then to make these dehumanized but human caused hyper objects human again, um, to make them hyper subjects that they uh, that are able to create their own possibilities of appropriation. Among other things, uh, by, for example, revolutionary infrastructures that moves away from in inefficient uh, supply, supply change of fossil and nuclear energy to sun, wind, and biomass, which get along with uh, long, without long supply chains. A key element uh, of making ourselves hyper uh, subjects. That is what Dominic says uh, in an interview, and I find it very sympathetic. Uh, a first step is, and I quote him, if we took ourselves less seriously, um, it would help a lot. <laughs> However, Dominic, we will still take you and your talk and your thoughts uh, very seriously, and I hope I have done justice to your amazingly complex projects and researches. Uh, we are very grateful to have you here and looking forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sara. Thanks to all the organizers for the invitation. I'm honored and delighted to be with you today. Wish I could be with you today, uh, but uh, and I wish I could have been with you virtually, uh, more present. But of course, uh, unfortunately, the uh, timeline of the conference uh, interceded with the uh, settler colonial festival of the United States called Thanksgiving, and so most of the past two days I've been either traveling or um, or uh, overindulging in food 
food with my family. Uh, still, nonetheless, happy to be here. As I was telling folks before we got started today, you're saving me from this terrible ritual of Black Friday uh, that I hope that I hear is actually now present in Europe too. So I'm again, uh, sorry for another plague that the United States has unleashed upon Europe. It's it's all too many. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And as so I was saying, I'm not going to take myself too seriously. It's the end of a long week for you. I'm going to try to keep it lively, uh, but uh, yet hopefully pithy at the same time. So uh, one of the reasons I was delighted to be uh, asked to speak to you about infrastructures and ecology is that it gave me a chance to pull together some different threads of thinking and research that I've been engaged with over the past decade. I like to say that I didn't go looking for infrastructure. Infrastructure came looking for me and hailed me in a sort of Altusarian way, where at a certain point I had to begin to ask myself questions. Why Why is everybody talking about infrastructure? Why now? Uh, what is it about infrastructure that expresses a certain zeitgeist of our moment? And it's a moment that's been enduring now for over a decade, certainly. And my first thought, and I don't think it was necessarily my best thought, but I still would present it to you in, in, with humility, was that perhaps Perhaps we were seeing something of a nostalgia for the Keynesian moment in the mid 20th century after three or four decades of neoliberalism when we find that the kinds of infrastructures that neoliberalism was interested in were principally those uh, uh, that, that enabled its projects of global expansion and especially of the expansion of the an intensification of the temporalities of finance capital. So digital information and communication infrastructures, for example, are neoliberal infrastructure par excellence, but neoliberalism was much less interested in what many people conventionally regard as infrastructure when in the United States we talk about an infrastructure uh, bill that the Biden administration wants to put together. We're talking about highways and waterways and public schools and public housing. These kinds of infrastructures that are really mid 20th century infrastructures are the ones that have been deeply neglected over the past three or four decades. So in some subtle way, perhaps uh, us intellectuals are as much a part of a civil society as anybody else, perhaps in some ways our unconscious expression of desire for a return to the mid 20th century is part of what informs our discussions of infrastructure. But then I also thought, uh, STS was far ahead of anthropology, for example, in the conceptualization of infrastructure and putting infrastructure forward as an interesting area of discussion. And when you think about who the leading lights of the infrastructural turn in science and technology studies were, we're thinking of people like Susan Lee Starr, of Jeff Bowker, of Karen Ruhlader, and all of them worked within digital information and communication technology, sort of at the time the internet is being born and being popularized. We find that the infrastructure turn comes. And so I think of it perhaps as part of a certain uh, set of aspirations regarding digital futurity. The promises of the mid 1990s, for those of you who are old enough like me to remember them, were greater connectivity, greater democracy, uh, greater flows of information, perhaps a whole new uh, set of uh, creative industries that would appear uh, based in virtual worlds that would be a way of easing ourselves out of the industrial industrial capitalist uh, trajectory towards perhaps a better, uh, more just future. Now, of course, 30, 40 years later, 20, let's see, 25 or 30 years later, those promises seem very empty, right? Instead, we're thinking of information overloads. We're thinking about post-truth politics. Uh, we're thinking about algorithmic manipulation of political communities and political sentiments. And in this era where we feel the evaporation of the promises of digital futurity that were so revolutionary in the mid 1990s, perhaps this informs our sense of wanting to tarry with infrastructure longer, to think with infrastructure as a way of asking what different kinds of trajectories could we enable in this moment? What alternatives to the ecocidal Anthropocene trajectory could be imagined? And that links, I think, to a more recent set of thoughts I've been having about the crisis uh, in epistemic cultures, uh, among cultures of experts, sort of across across the, the world, regarding how much our systems of 
expert knowledge are uh, are apt to the tasks of the Anthropocene trajectory. And there's a, a wonderful article by Sarah Vaughan on mangroves in Guyana, where she talks about the inverse performativity of the Anthropocene. And I think this is such a great way of conceptualizing it. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the concept of performativity, the idea that expert models co-create the worlds that they pretend to be taking a snapshot of, that expert models actually create the worlds they're trying to map. Uh, well, the inverse performativity that Vaughn describes is about the fact that with this increasingly unruly, unpredictable, uh, uh, out of alignment uh, set and even chaotic in some sets uh, set of ecosystems and earth systems across the world, that increasingly we don't have uh, relevant paradigms to, uh, to, to, to sort of capture uh, and snapshot this, this rapidly changing world. The world itself is forcing us to dramatically adjust uh, our epistemic work. And in that way, again, the question of infrastructure comes up. Uh, how can we conceptualize, uh, design plans for the future when in fact the world itself seems to be so in such an unruly phase? And in that sense, I would link this perhaps to a, a broad broader or deeper existential concern that Anna Singh and her collaborators have articulated so passionately uh, about the need to imagine and enact alternate futurities on a damaged planet. I think all of this is part of the infrastructure turn. All of this is part of the, what informs the interest in a conversation like the one that you've staged here. In my view, all of it is incredibly important and very much expresses our zeitgeist. And so what I want to suggest in this uh, paper is that infrastructures always enable it's really in the in the word itself infrastructure uh, brian larkin has made a a, a wonderful uh, intervention where he's discussed that infrastructures always mediate and i think that's often true but i would say more fundamentally they always enable but they contain within them different subjunctive promises different kinds of futures that they imagine and promise us and thus they are organized, designed, if you will, uh, to em enable different kinds of futures. So what I'd like to do in this essay, and again, drawing on my work uh, as uh, an illustration for each of these different modes, I wanna talk about three different modes of infrastructure. I wanna talk about gray infrastructure, green infrastructure, and then what I'm terming revolutionary infrastructure, each of which I think have different operational uh, modes and each of which have different subjective promises attached to them. So without further ado, I'm going to leap right in and talk about gray infrastructure, which is conceived as human engineered material designs able to produce predictable, controllable effects. Gray infrastructure conceives futures that by and large reproduce present Anthropocene relations. And what I mean by that is the idea that there's uh, an ontological distinction between humanity and nature, and that humanity has been gifted by some power, the, the capacities of reason and technology to control nature and to uh, predict its outcomes, and thus to be able to de design interventions that that move according to the spirit of, yes, perhaps we have uh, messed up the world with our industrial capitalism, but humanity and only humanity is capable of designing the solutions uh, that will remedy that. So this idea of gray infrastructure is really focused on a sort of command and control uh, ideology. Uh, and you'll see that uh, coming into fruition in my case study of Houston. It's a place that I live. And it's a place that I do, uh, I've been working on anthropologically, conceptually for the past several years. And a particular infrastructural complex has become a bit of an obsession for me. The Houston Ship Channel Industrial Corridor, the largest assemblage of petrochemical infrastructure in the Western Hemisphere. You have to imagine uh, a, a wide river here and that what you're seeing with refineries and petroleum uh, storage tanks and petrochemical facilities extends for about 50 miles. It's an amazing, it's, it's almost uh, has to be seen to be believed as well as the, the, the terrible conditions under which the, the human communities that live next to this infrastructure, what they have to endure. But I want to tell you a little bit about the history of Houston to talk a little bit about the history of its infrastructural ecology to contextualize what I'm describing uh, today. And uh, this is what Houston used to look like before the petrochemical infrastructure came. It was a region that was swamp and coastal prairie and pine woodlands. There were 20 riverine bio systems that cross cut what is now Houston. And the lands and the waters that 
became Houston were home to the Karankawa, the Akokisa, and other indigenous peoples at least 8,000 years before Spanish and later Anglo conquest. But Houston has been an infrastructural center since its inception. It was nominally founded as a center of political infrastructure. It was built to be the capital of a new a Republic of Texas, but mosquitoes and yellow fever and floods soon drove the political culture west towards Austin. It didn't take long. It took like two years for people to realize that Houston was a hopeless place <laughs> to have a government. And so everything went west. But at the same time, it thrived. It thrived because of infrastructure, because of the way its watery lands and landish waters allowed for a unique combination of transportation infrastructure, notably railroads and shipping, that made it the key processing point for the proceeds of the plantation slave economies in the region. And these are the, the folks who actually built Houston, the Houston that we know, uh, working in the cotton and sugar plantations in what I like to call the Texan plantation of scene. Houston was spared destruction in the Civil War, but became an important hub of military manufacture, its booming lumber, cotton, and sugar exports attracted and concentrated other kinds of manufacturing and administrative labor, cotton compresses and cotton oil seed mills, brass and iron foundries, car wheel works, railroad shops. And during the last decades of the 19th century, it became the urban industrial center of Texas and was described in 1905 as the chief cotton concentration point in the world. So you know Houston, if you know it at all, as a center of the oil industry, and it's always been that. But before it was the center of the petroleum industry, it was the world center of the cotton oil industry, which went on to create margarine and sort of all sorts of edible plants oil products that that spread across the world too and that's a whole other story fascinating one but not one for today's discussion the next phase of houston's infrastructural ecology was summoned and shaped by two fateful events the great storm of 1900 that left galveston in ruin still by far the most devastating hurricane in the history of the united states it rendered houston by default the major port in southeastern texas the discovery of oil at Spindletop the next year paved the way for Houston to become the nation's largest petroleum and petrochemical export hub over the course of the 20th century. Already by 1911, Houston is described by contemporaries as the center of the oil industry. And in 1914, a deep water port was completed southeast of Houston city center, capstoning the 50 mile Houston ship channel. The ship channel would grow, as I've discussed, over the course of the next four decades into the largest complex of petroleum refining and petrochemical manufacturing in the Western Hemisphere. It also, by the mid 20th century, had become the hometown of rapid growth petroculture in so many different ways. 90% of Houston's growth occurred during the automobile era. Houston sprawled like no city before it, hyperactively lengthening its spines, eschewing, ignoring infill, eschewing density, swallowing smaller surrounding settlements with relish, eventually reaching 600 square miles, the largest area of any major US city by far. You could drop all the cities in the Northeast and the United States into the uh, urban footprint of Houston easily. Houston is also the large, the only large US city without a zoning ordinance. The effect upon urban space was profound a metastasizing mass of centers and peripheries guided by no design other than the competing opportunisms of various real estate developers. And there's this wonderful quote from a Houston architect that I love to read because it epitomizes to me the Houston you see depicted in the image on the right. The more seemingly placeless Houston grows, the more it can seem like Houston. If the generic colonization of sprawling settlements with little regard for local conditions can be said to have a hometown, here it is. It also became during this period an epicenter of toxic, unregulated infrastructure, especially along the Ship Channel Corridor. It's home to some of the most uh, intense cancer clusters in the United States. Really, the only ones that are worse are in Louisiana. Uh, sometimes the cancer rates of cancer incidents and uh, are 30 times as high in eastern Houston or along the Ship Channel as they are in western Houston, let alone in parts of the country that are removed from this infrastructure. So toxicity is integral to this mode of gray infrastructure infrastructure here. But if we want to talk about gray infrastructure today, and of course, that's what I'm aspiring to do in, in this talk, I need to talk about the hydropolitics of flooding, because flooding is really what people talk about in the gray infrastructural mode today. Um, there have been 
2,000-year flood events in the past five years, I'm sorry, six years in Houston. And in addition, there have been two 500-year flood events. So that's four 500-year plus flood events in just six years, which makes you wonder, well, a 500-year flood event isn't what it used to be, right? But you begin to see why Houston is becoming obsessed with what do we do to reduce risks of flooding, while, of course, otherwise not wanting to change anything about its fundamental organization or model. And this is where we have to think about flooding together, or where I find it helpful to think about flooding together with scholars like Dalit de Cunha um, from Harvard, who, uh, who make a case that flooding is in intrinsically a matter of infrastructural politics and imagination. It's predicated on the belief that a rain-driven wetness, as he puts it, of a place like Mumbai or Houston can be divided cleanly into watercourse on the one hand and dry land on the other. As he writes, the line transgressed is not simply a line drawn, it's a line imposed. Furthermore, this line does not simply separate water from land, it creates water and land. On either side of it is entities that can be commodified and as such coveted, made scarce and violated. So once you draw a river on a map, once the water leaks out of that line, people begin to say flood, it's flooding. But in fact, the possibility of flood itself has been created by that cartographic exercise in the first place. And there is more and more uh, of those cartographic violations coming. As Kasper Brunjensen tells us, an amphibious future is beckoning in cities like Houston and Mumbai. He writes, after a few centuries where terrestrialization was in the ascendant, the amphibious is gaining new life. The, uh, in many parts of the world, water now seems to be flowing back into land, submerging coastal areas on a semi-permanent basis or creating recurrent floods, making the insufficiency of terrestrial responses increasingly apparent. Forbes magazine has celebrated Houston as the city with the second most engineers per capita in the United States. It, it, the only city to exceed it is San Jose, where Silicon Valley is based. So uh, Houston, between NASA, uh, between the petroleum industry, uh, between the medical industry, and of course, universities like Rice, just chock full of engineers. So perhaps it's unsurprising because engineers love gray infrastructure, as I found. Um, the hydro politics of the city are dominated by gray infrastructural logics and they range from very small projects, projects of elevating homes to escape uh, flood risk. And you see here some images from my research of home elevation projects where uh, a, a mid 20th century modern home is about it is tunneled under uh, and, and put on hydraulic jacks and then lifted into the air two or three meters where pylons are put underneath it. So you can preserve the same home, the same lifestyle, but just elevated two or three meters into the air. Again, without addressing any of the contextual conditions that would have necessitated a flood escape in the first place, yes? Um, but it's not obviously just personal projects that are, there are massive projects, large scale regional gray infrastructure projects composed of widened channelized water courses, new bridges, detention systems that seek to reduce flood risks. And here's an example of what this sort of pure division between dry land and water course looks like in a rechannelized bio. Here's another image where again, so pristine, so clean, the water is staying exactly where it belongs, right? And then we have a green manicured lawn, we have beautifully elegantly designed bridges. All of this is supposed to uh, connote the sense that yes, flooding is a problem, but the engineers are ready to fix it, to solve it. Flooding will no longer be a problem once the engineers do their work. Some of this work is at an even larger scale. The US Army Corps of Engineers has engaged in interesting, and I think it's always very concerning Learning projects of speculative watershed engineering. I mentioned to you the 20 bayou systems. The Army Corps of Engineers now wants to create ways to shift water between the bayou systems so that they can well, determine uh, if one area is flooding, they can move water to it. It all sounds good, of course, but not in the face of uh, events like Hurricane Hardy that flooded all of the bayou system. So there's a lot of time and energy and money that are being invested in these projects. And here's another one, the so-called Ike Dyke uh, that was recently uh, um, authorized, which will create a, a, a barrier across the entrance to Galveston Bay, preventing the storm surge that could be associated with larger tropical cyclones, category four, category five hurricanes to sweep up. Uh, we're 
talking maybe a seven or eight meter storm surge, uh, sweeping up the ship channel and beginning to compromise these thousands of unregulated and uh, basically unsecured uh, petroleum and chemical storage tanks. If even um, some colleagues at Rice have estimated this, if even 10% of those containers were to fail during a major surge event, you would have the rough equivalent of the Exxon Valdez oil spill happening within the fourth largest metropolitan center in the United States. So you can understand uh, the, the precarity of the situation and why these projects want to be built. But again, they're being built in a city that continues to refine 14% of the, United, the entire United States uh, petroleum on a daily basis. And that is something that is never being questioned or challenged. So the most recent um, gray infrastructure utopia that's worth uh, learning a little bit more about is uh, focused on the idea of constructing deep tunnels, 20 or 30 feet wide, 200 feet below ground that could evacuate floodwater from Houston at the cost of $100 million per mile. Yet the truth is, uh, even the engineers admit that this might reduce floodwater flow by as little as 1%, but you wouldn't know that to read the local papers where people are very interested in these deep tunnels. But remember, Houston itself is only about 50 feet above sea level. So if you're digging a, a, a tunnel 200 feet below uh, sea level, the water has nowhere to go. Essentially, you're constructing massive underground lakes rather than flood prevention. But again, this is something that's beyond, there's an irrationality, a hallucinatory dimension to this that I really want to emphasize in terms of gray infrastructure. It's hallucinatory in some ways, fundamentally. It always could compel uh, repetition compulsion to seek an engineering solution, no matter how expensive and unlikely they are to succeed. Houston has already seen hundreds of billions of dollars invested into inadequate gray infrastructure. And I can't think of a better way of describing it than what Adriana Petruna describes as diligent insanity. Uh, we can consider gray infrastructure as a materialization of what Lauren Berlant calls the cruel optimism in which the object of one's desire actually compromises one's possibility of flourishing. Because more water is coming, more water than any configuration of gray infrastructural ecology is likely to be able to manage. Um, and if you look here, uh, I'm sure you're aware that the world is on a, a Pliocene pathway already, perhaps even an Eocene pathway again. The amount of um, atmospheric carbon dioxide already uh, in the atmosphere today has been correlated by paleoclimatologists with about 20 meters of sea level rise. So if everything were nothing, we weren't to add any more, but we were sort of to keep static over the next several centuries, we would see sea level rise that would come probably up to about 20 meters. And this is what Houston would look like in a 20 meter sea level uh, scenario. You see here, it's largely underwater. And it's not just Houston, this will impact hydropolitical utopias across the world. One of the most successful of these utopias has been the Netherlands, as you know. Um, they have, have, uh, you know, and, and with good reason, have taken great pride in their hydrological engineering and in their hydropolitics, which they export to places like Houston. I can't tell you how many Dutch uh, water emissaries have come to Houston in the past five years to talk about the Dutch way forward. And the Dutch way forward is, in a sense, modeled on the Dutch way that's been used in the past. It simply won't work in the future. There's a scenario, it just won't and so some interesting projects are beginning to develop. This is by an urban landscape group uh, whose project NL2200, you can look it up online if you're interested, uh, is a great mapping of the nation formerly known as the Netherlands, uh, a scenario that's based on retreat to areas that are higher uh, elevation rather than um, thinking about the ability to defend everything in its current terrestrial uh, model where, again, dry land and water course can cleanly be divided from one another. I've become interested together with my partner, Simony Howe, in thinking about, you know, what might a Houston look like that sought to move away from this toxic infrastructural history? What would a Houston look like that could embrace an amphibious future? And we're working with a local designer, Ilsa Harrison, on visualizing what an amphibious Houston might look like, a Houston that accepted uh, its situation and sought to thrive in an amphibious model rather than investing so much money, so much time and energy into trying to defend a model that's simply undefendable. This is a bit more in the spirit of what I call revolutionary infrastructure later on, so I'll stop there. 
I want to turn now to green infrastructure. And green infrastructure, you're quite familiar with in Germany, I know, um, because you're a world leader in it. Um, the solar, the wind, the geothermal, uh, among others, uh, kinds of infrastructures that are conceived as natural nature cultural interventions that bend, inflect, uh, hope ultimately to defeat the Anthropocene trajectory. But I want to say that not all green infrastructures are created alike. And I'm not saying that I, I dislike them all or I think that they're all problematic. I have just found in the course of my research that a lot of what passes for green infrastructure today still fails to challenge the logics of industrial capitalist expansion, relentless growth. This idea of green capitalism, I find particularly pernicious, the idea that capitalism can really um, effectively manage a transition to uh, a sustainable future, given that its own internal dynamics are so incredibly unsustainable. And, and this is something that's not news. Andre Gortz was writing about this in the 1970s. In some ways, we, we have forgotten this uh, and have to keep rediscovering it again. So what I'll talk about today is a couple of different models of green, uh, two different shades of green, let's say, two different shades of green infrastructural imaginations that are focused on the research that Simony and I have done on wind power development in southern Mexico. And here is the context for that research, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. You see with a satellite image that there's a little uh, gap in the Sierra Madre Mountains here. And that gap creates a natural wind corridor, which because of the barometric pressure differential of the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean, creates a wind tunnel in which the wind can on just a normal winter day without any kind of special cyclonic activity or storm front, it can reach up to nearly tropical storm force. This is wind that will tear the paint off boats. It can mangle uh, tractor trailer trucks. Uh, it can knock roofs off homes with ease. It's a very powerful wind. Uh, and it's a wind that obviously uh, has attracted the attention of people interested in capturing that resource. But this area of Mexico Mexico has been a resource frontier for five centuries, ever since the Spanish arrived and decided it was one of the most lucrative potentially uh, parts of, of New Spain. Um, Another incident that I like to mention is that in the 1850s, this nearly became part of the United States as the United States sought to build what eventually became the Panama Canal Zone. One of the first places they looked was in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And in fact, the Mexican government was ready to sell the Isthmus to the United States. It was only because that the group that had organized this was based in New Orleans, and it was just on the eve of the American Civil War. And the United States Senate declined to ratify this treaty because they were afraid of giving the South still more economic power when everyone knew a conflict was brewing. So, um, but for the, the internal politics of the United States, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec would be a United States uh, uh, property protectorate at this point. And this betrayal of, the, uh, of their land and livelihood by the Mexican government has been not forgotten by the indigenous communities of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec these many uh, decades later. So um, most recently, the Isthmus has become a zone of what we call aeolian politics and desire, the power of the wind. Uh, and you see here in this map made by USAID, where you see this bright red and bright blue colors on the right hand side of the image. This is wind resources that are literally off the charts that are above excellent in terms of their of how hard the wind blows and how sustained the strength of the wind is. Um, so it became a very early on dating back to the 1970s, uh, an object of desire for international wind developers. And what really then helped to catalyze this was the realization that Mexic the Mexican Petro state was beginning to fail in a significant way. Um, that Mexican oil production, which had begun uh, to seriously ramp up in the 1970s during the global oil crisis, peaked in 2003 at 3.5 million barrels per day, and that has been declining ever since, now is down 50% uh, in less than two decades. So this is a major crisis for a country where oil revenue provides the Mexican state, oil sales, I should say, provides the Mexican state with up to 43% of its annual budget.
Um, of course, it's not just uh, the, the cynical uh, attempt to defend a failing petrostate. Uh, Felipe Calderon, a president from 2006 to 2012, was also very aware of the challenges of the Anthropocene for Mexico and how it would challenge uh, what Tim Mitchell calls its carbon democracy. Um, so he built upon an earlier series of explorations of this uh, resource. Uh, the, the first test projects, the first experimental prototypes of wind power were public projects that came on grid in the early 1990s. But it was really only with the, um, the Calderon administration that they began to develop seriously and at large scale wind development. And so it became an area of PPP or public private partnership investment in the 2000s as part of a strategy of privatizing electricity generation that it's true had been part of the neoliberal turn in Mexico more broadly. But um, the politics and negotiations, I'm sorry, that led to this more directly connect to um, Calderon's push on climate, which culminated in the general law on climate in 2012, that, that actually laid out some, I think, not just in terms of the developing world, but in terms of the world as the whole, some very bold goals. 35% of Mexico's energy is legally mandated. This isn't a target, it's law, to come from renewable sources or clean sources by 2024, with 50% of that um, estimated to come from wind power itself. So you begin to see how important wind power is to the model of decarbonization in Mexico. In the space of less than a decade, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec came to host the densest concentration of onshore wind parks anywhere in the world with 2.8 gigawatts of installed capacity, plans to extend that to five gigawatts or beyond in the years to come. All of the wind parks are industrial self-supply projects in which large corporations, Walmart, Semex, Femsa Heineken, uh, finance green energy development to earn carbon credits and often to improve their corporate image. Communities, meanwhile, the communities that are near the park, as you can see here, the communities like La Ventosa, La Venta, Huchitan, uh, San Diniso de Mar, Ixtepec, uh, these communities experience the industrialization of what had hitherto been a very you know, a vibrant uh, agrarian and ranching uh, landscape. But the electrical infrastructure benefits the state and high energy consumers, most of whom do not live in this region, but rather farther north and west in Mexico. Meanwhile, the rents that are paid by wind companies uh, to wealthy landowners have exacerbated in significant ways social inequality and social unrest in the region. This PPP self uh, self supply model mobilized resistance, uh, especially among indigenous Binisa or Zapotec. Uh, activists uh, back in the mid 2000s and the logics of resistance were complex and fluid and ranged from lack of local consultation and project design to food insecurity concerns to rejection of mega proyecto or mega project level development uh, to concerns about environment and species impacts activists were clear uh, to us in our research that they didn't reject renewable energy per se only the way it was being conceived and institutionalized the the question of indigenous sovereignty was paramount for them, and wind park resistance indeed helped prompt an indigenous political renaissance across the southern isthmus during the period of our fieldwork, including not only Zapotec communities, but Ikots or Wave communities as well. A critical watershed in the Renaissance was the plan of an Australian-led consortium called Moreno Renovables to build the largest single-phase wind park in Latin America, it would have been 396 megawatts. The project developers proudly described the park as a globally significant contribution to the green energy revolution. The park was designed to be built on a sandbar, communal land of the Ocotz town of San Diniz de Mar, accessible by road only from the Binisa community of Alvaro Obregón. The sandbar was also an area to which fisher folk across the lagoon had traditional access rights. During 2012 and 2013, the project catalyzed a resistance campaign of a scale the Isthmus had not seen in decades, bringing together for the first time, it was said, Ikots and Benisa people in a common project of self-defense against external influence and exploitation. Assembleas or uh, political assemblies began to proliferate around the region, promising not only the end of one wind park, but a challenge to the extractivist logic of PPP self-supply more generally. 
The resistance promised a new era of political autonomy involving the end of political manipulation by local bosses and political parties, new community police organizations and indigenous language radio stations came into being. Voting booths were prohibited in some communities as part of a push to reestablish communal political institutions known as usos y costumbres. It's the uprising evinced what uh, Haudenosaunee anthropologist Audra Simpson has termed an indigenous politics of refusal of Mexican and Oaxacan state sovereignty aimed at defeating the cunning of recognition, that's Beth Pabinelli's term, practiced by settler multicultural liberalism. And just to bring the story to a conclusion, in late 2012, blockades were set up at both ends of the sandbar. Um, they faced violence from state police and from supporters of the park project. We personally bore witness to this violence when we visited um, uh, the community of Alvaro Obregón on the Day of the Dead in 2012 and uh, uh, saw that the state police had just minutes before we arrived broken the blockade to allow developers topographical crews to begin work. They used tear gas to disrupt the blockade and detain several individuals. But later that day, a larger group of several hundred protesters returned to chase the police off and reestablish the barricade. The company's trucks were seized by the, uh, by, the, um, the, by the protesters and ransomed, or in one case destroyed as a culminating event of protest against the wind parks. As one of the leaders of Alvaro's new uh, Asamblea Comunitaria, Community Assembly, said the blockade would continue indefinitely. He said, if they want to see blood in the sand, let them come. And the tragedy of this, you know, from the point of view of those of us who care about renewable energy development, believe that it's necessary, if not, if not sufficient, uh, part of bending the Anthropocene trajectory, is that renewable energy had become synonymous with exploitation and dispossession. It didn't need to be that way. But neither the government nor the project developers could honestly fathom why. We had very honest conversations with the Lieutenant Governor of Oaxaca and with the, uh, the chief um, uh, negotiator of Moreno Vanovables, who simply couldn't understand the basis for people's concerns, and in part because they didn't understand the history and they were really concerned with the community interest at a basic way. To make a long story short, the blockade held, the Morania project was canceled, the Oaxacan government desperately tried to relocate the project and eventually did create a wind park of a similar size in a community not far away that had a private property regime rather than a communal property regime. But lest we, lest we focus only on the exploitative side and the extractive side of renewable energy, which of course is there and it's serious and it's a serious concern, especially on projects um, in, in the so-called developing world. Um, there was a project, a kind of a unicorn loan project in Mexico at that time that drew our attention because it was an effort to imagine wind power beyond the PPP self-supply model, a green, and I mean this a light green, you can't quite tell from the image, but a light green uh, infrastructure project that sought to promote indigenous sovereignty and reinforce traditions of collective land use and management, which was called the Yansa Ixtepec project. Yantzik Stepek had been in the work since 2009. It was a unique collaboration between an NGO that sought to export the Danish model of community owned wind to the global south and a group of comuneros who, who saw the, the potential to leverage the Isthmian wind to spur social development and to create a future for Ixtepec's youth that, that, that was beyond their agrarian and military past. The project it, had it been allowed to proceed would have cost 185 million euro, uh, which they thought they could raise very easily through development bank funding and European social investments. It would have produced 102 megawatts of renewable energy. And the key thing is it would have set 50% of its estimated 3.5 million euro annual profits to a trust established by the community assembly in Ixtepec that would have funded a retirement scheme for farmers and also new investments in women's and youth projects. And this was so striking, this 50%, because the current profit share for communities working with privately financed wind parks is only about 2%. And as such, Yance Ixtepec was actively thwarted by wind industry leaders invested in PPP self-supply because of course they realized if you were offering communities the option of 50% return for social development investment or a 2% return that would largely go to already wealthy individuals to increase social inequality, the communities would have always chose the 50%. It would have literally uh, brought down uh, the entire model. And so what happened instead was that the government 
and especially its parastatal electricity utility, CFE, dismissed Yonsa Ixtepec as a fully utopian venture. CFE refused to allow the partnership to bid for grid interconnection because it could not demonstrate 25 million euro in the bank uh, already sort of ready and uh, obviously an impossible standard for a poor farming community. But the story gets more complex. Uh, CFE had also occupied Ixtepec in communal land, critics said illegally, to build the largest electrical substation in Mexico to evacuate all that wind power from the PPP parks. Uh, the Comuna challenged CFE in court and won an injunction from a federal judge in 2013 to investigate both the refusal to allow Yansa Ixtepec to bid, as well as what happened with this so-called squatter substation. And unfortunately, several years later, the case remained mired in legal uh, technicalities and difficulties, formally unresolved, but no one really believes that the park project will go ahead. Uh, meanwhile, the Ener Energy Ministry, Sener, has given CFE its blessing to move ahead with projects of building more uh, electrical grid infrastructure in Ixtepec. What's come out of this has been a real global conversation, including the United Nations, about what constitutes uh, legitimate consultation and informed consent in negotiations between developers, the government, and indigenous communities. And it's essentially for ceased wind park development in southern Mexico. Capital has decided it's too risky and would prefer to move investments elsewhere. And in, again, we can think about this in many respects, but uh, but again, uh, the failure to develop this resource in a way that was not viewed as extractive by communities shows that green infrastructure can fall all too readily into the habits of, of settler colonial, the grooves, as I say, of settler colonial institutions, rather than seeking alternate trajectories forward. And this image uh, in a in a small uh, on a small house in an out of the way street of La Ventosa for me captures this feeling of being dispossessed by wind parks as they preside, these husk like figures preside over an era desiccated land and an indigenous boy seeks to you know, extract some nourishment um, from the last bit of corn. So you, this is where green infrastructure can take us. That isn't necessary that it takes us there, but green infrastructure, I would say, especially green infrastructure that operates with gray infrastructure as its backdrop is often the issue here. And I wanna move now in the final, and I won't be too much longer, I promise, in the final minutes of my presentation to talk about revolutionary infrastructure, which is a concept I've written about in a couple of different places and probably in ways that have been generally found to be insufficient, inadequate, gestural instead of definitive. And unfortunately, you're gonna find that this is more of the same. What I'll say about revolutionary infrastructure is that its infrastructure conceived less as engineered structure with predictable controllable impacts and more as an experimental enabling relation as redirection of the potential energy contained within existing systems and as transformative opportunity. Projects of revolutionary infrastructure are diverse, they're locally attuned, and often invisible to conventional infrastructural politics. And this is in part because they adopt a humbler political ontology, but also because they operate at a different scale, like gut bacteria, I'd like to say. We couldn't do anything in our lives without our gut bacteria, yet we never think of them as agents, <laughs> and never think of them as agents of our abilities. But in this way, I think revolutionary infrastructure works within existing gray and green infrastructural ecologies, hacking, redistributing, releasing stored energies to infrastructure alternative trajectories to those of the plantation as seen, the capital as seen, the Anthropocene, you choose your scene. There's a recognition here, as Deleuze once put it quite brilliantly, that these so-called socio-material systems, and I've been using this language, I'm as guilty of it as anybody, but are thinking about these uh, systems as being systemic, uh, is, is inadequate to the reality of our situation. Systems are leaky and porous compositions. Deleuze used to say the system is leaking all over the place. There's much less to them than they purport to be. Their supposed grand scales are often a mirage. And the work of revolutionary infrastructure is, as Sara was saying before, it's hyposubjective, rejecting the transcendent hypersubjective command and control thinking in favor of experimental subsendence and rebecoming. And what's meant here with the distinction between transcendence and subsendence is transcendence is 
the sort of the, uh, the, the moving above and out of relationships. It is, in a sense, the attempt to establish the God's eye view, the Archimedean point uh, beyond the networks of enabling relations in which we exist so that we can design, so that we can scheme and control and sort of pull the marionette strings from above. Subsendence, on the other hand, is the, is the process of moving back into relations, is of being present and situated in networks of relations and of engaging of projects, often very humble projects of re-becoming. So what I like to say about revolutionary infrastructure is that it doesn't have a clear categorization or a clear definition. It doesn't really have a proper typology or theory, but I think we discover it as we feel our way forward on non-ecocidal, non-genocidal pathways. Again, they don't have to be massively scaled. In fact, the most, uh, the most intimate uh, of pathways are sometimes the most important. Uh, we can embrace emergence for our time of emergency. So what I'll do in just the last few minutes here is just to talk briefly, gesture at a few of the emergences that I've been fortunate enough to participate in. I can't talk about all of them at the length I'd like, uh, but as director of SENS at Rice, I was able to be involved in a number of different, more kind of creative artistic projects. And I'll just uh, highlight this one here in the upper left, making the best of it, Signal Foods for Climate Chaos. This was a collaboration with the New York-based artist, Marina Zirko. And Zirko was interested in the future of oceanic ecosystems and with the stressing of, of ecosystems because of oceanic acidification, because of industrial fertilizer use, the dead zones. Uh, she was fascinated by the way that ancient species like algae and jellyfish species that sort of thrive in low oxygen environments have returned to the fore and the ways in which they will constitute the future of seafood in many ways. So she created a line of shelf stable jellyfish snacks together with uh, Houston um, uh, chefs. And the idea was to create a food truck that would sort of go around Houston uh, offering jellyfish snacks and engaging people through the sort of simple acts of eating uh, commensality uh, information uh, about talking about the future of oceans and, and the future of oceanic uh, ecosystems through, again, the humble act of eating together and sharing food. I think it's a beautiful way to think about how one can be more present for the relations of a damaged planet, uh, not simply to sort of push them aside and say, we're going to fix this, but rather to own it, to become part of these relations again. And uh, the project is, to my mind, still one of the favorites I had a chance to work on in that context. Some of you are aware of the podcast that we did, again, an, uh, an attempt to create a humble space for communication, uh, for processing, for sharing information involving artists and humanists and scientists and politicians talking about the energy and environmental challenges of our era, but always in a mode that tried not to take itself so seriously. Again, I really want to underscore this point that Zara has very perceptively picked up about my own approach to revolutionary infrastructure is that it's good to be small and humble and not take yourself too seriously. Thus, perhaps we were attracted to the story of Okirkup, the small, humble, forgotten glacier that became uh, famous as the first major Icelandic glacier, the first named glacier to disappear because of climate change. And here's an image of the little documentary film we made about it, including a uh, strange talking mountain. Other projects, one of them called Low Carbon Leisure, Low Carbon Pleasure, uh, is a project that we've been simmering for several years, uh, including some events in Texas uh, that have been talking to people about how to uh, remind ourselves that uh, there are forms of leisure and pleasure uh, that are, could be abundant uh, in a uh, context that was reversing the Anthropocene trajectory. Um, many of the best things in life, love, laughter, play, typically don't ruin the world. They can be enjoyed even to, <laughs> even to abundance. Uh, as our colleague Lacey M. Johnson says, it's important to remember that joy is a form that justice takes. A lot of environmental messaging is about austerity, and we know that that works well for highly disciplined people in certain kinds of contexts. But part of the obstacle we face is that in addition to overwhelming people emotionally with this discourse of ruin and apocalypse, that also um, we somehow seem to be telling people that there will be no joy in, in a low carbon world. And that's absolutely patently untrue. So it, it behooves us all to think about those pathways and to practice this. And most recently, we've developed a, a small card game together with some uh, artists in Scotland that focuses on sort of creating a, a practical, simple how-to guide to sort of find uh, low carbon leisure and pleasure pathways uh, under today's circumstances.
Um, on the spirit of coming into new relations with the damaged planet, I do enjoy our unglacier tour where we took people to the site of Volkirkult on a couple of different occasions to engage with this place of absence where a glacier once was. Um, that project in turn inspired the making of the Volkirkult Memorial, which was by far our most successful project, I suppose, in terms of uh, popular resonance. But the thing that I think made it work was the fact that it's quite an intimate statement. Uh, the text written by uh, uh, our collaborator, the wonderful um, Icelandic writer Andrés Snar Magnusson, whose most recent work on time and water is some, one that I would highly recommend to anybody interested in these thematics. His letter to the future creates a, a small appeal across generations uh, to hold uh, us in account uh, for what we know today and our ability or our failure to act on that knowledge. And I do think that the intimacy of the appeal and the familiarity of a, a, of a memorial uh, were things that brew, brought people into this conversation and community of feeling uh, around climate change that, that might not have come otherwise. And finally, because hypo subjects was mentioned too, I think I, I'll mention that this this has been one of the more fun projects that I've had a chance to work on together with Tim Tim Morton. Um, it was judged on its first set of reviews to be both flimsy and chaotic, which were <laughs> we took that as a as a badge of honor. Precisely flimsy chaos is what we're all about. We've been describing this project as something called improv philosophy, and I'll read you these two just to bring us back to Houston where we started. I'll, I'll read this as part of the conclusion. Um, these are from not from the book, but from a, another article we've done recently. What Tim and I do in this is we actually talk, we have a conversation, we record it, we mash the the, the dialogue together into an insane uh, sort of monologue that seems to be arguing with itself and talking at cross purposes uh, as a way of destabilizing the the sort of the um, expert subject position of the sort of all-knowing author philosopher and rather into this strangely uh, chaotic space out of which still we hope uh, it creates a kind of a haunt uh, a, a, a refuge that still could be interesting for people especially those of us and i would hold myself in this group who really don't have it all figured out who really are uh, as much as anything being buoyed and buffeted by the uh, by the elements of our time so anyway this is what we say about houston Houston is constantly wilding. It's a subsendent space in the sense that it's really not one place at all, but a constant thrum of places of becoming and coming apart. A lot of Houston isn't in Texas at all. Everywhere you see an eight lane highway, you're experiencing Houston. Everywhere you find yourself in a suburban esque cul-de-sac, you've just phased into Houston. I would even say this of the ship channel, which is probably the most hyperactive objective part of Houston, the operational center of petroculture where the hyper object of petroleum tendrils into every aspect of high energy modernity. It's a metastasizing place clearly, but it also seems to be ultimately quite success susceptible to becoming unmade. There's so much happening here that doesn't have anything to do with the world of oil and petroculture in a way. The reason why this town exists paradoxically is the cancer of what some call petromodernity. Then the body evolved, evolved around the cancer and now the cancer could be removed and the body would be fine without it. Exactly. In a funny way, the cancer was never the real point, even though it was maybe the important resource we found here on the settler frontier. It's all led to the amazingly wonderful, broken, funky town quality of Houston. It's something that I absolutely love. When people come to visit and look at this place, they go, I could never get used to it here. And I say to them, neither could I. And in that spirit, one last collaboration, this one very much in the making, working together with Simony again on developing a television series set in uh, Houston called Petropolis that's really examining what ties us to the ecocidal trajectory, what the desires and the, the forces of unreason are that hold us to uh, a, a style of life that is, is undermining and destabilizing and ultimately destroying so much of what's wonderful in the world uh, in the name of, of continuing just a day, a week longer, um, the, the, the pleasures of petroculture, which are many, um, to be fair. But on the other hand, we know that the thrill, just like an addict, we know that the thrill can't last and that this more and more and more can't, can't, can't go on. And yet here we are still tethered to this in some way. And that's where I'm gonna stop um, because again, there's a lot to say, and I'd rather have the conversation than keep prattling on at you <laughs> endlessly about my thoughts on infrastructure. But there you have it. So three paradigms we could talk about and we could talk about anything else. And if anyone's interested, on the subject of metastasis, I'd love to share with you a wonderful story about the man I met recently who cured cancer. 
Uh, he's not known, but his story is amazing and in some ways symbolic, I think, of thinking about what it takes to unmake the infrastructural ecology uh, that is, uh, again, destabilizing so much of what we hold dear. But I'll stop there. Thank you.